Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. for time's sake. We cross out verse 2 for time's sake. Here we go. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living. Whatever men may say, I see His hand of mercy. I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow will always continue now and forever until he sounds that trumpet voice and mm. says it's Amen. over. Amen. So it's Amen. not over until God says it's over. When he calls out your name, then you know, 
Oh, it's done. I can lay down my sword. I can finally be home with you, Jesus. Amen. 184 in your red hymnal. Here we go. Do you hear them coming, brother? Thronging up the streets of light. Clad in glorious shining garments. Love wash garments pure and white. Tis a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. Tis a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. Do you hear the stirring anthems filling all the earth and sky? Tis a grand victorious army lift its banner up on high. Tis a glorious church without spot or wrinkle washed in the blood of the Lamb. Tis a glorious Washed in the blood of the Lamb. Never fear the clouds of sorrow. Never fear the storms of sin. We shall triumph on the morrow. Even now our joys begin. Tis a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. Tis a glorious In the blood of the Lamb, wave the banner, shout his praises, for our victory is nigh. We shall join our conquering Savior, we shall reign with him on high. Tis a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Tis a glorious church. In the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Amen. Let's all bow in a word of prayer. God, my Father, we thank you so much for a Lamb who's spotless, without blemish, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that Lamb and his precious blood that he shed, Heavenly Father, through that axis of blood, we can sing your praises, glorify your name. We are washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and are made kings and priests. Mm. Thank you so much for that, Father. And Heavenly Father, as we sit down here and hear your word, and as we spend time fellowshipping and praying, may everything that is said and done be pleasing to thee, edifying to the church, evangelize the lost, and most of all, give you the honor that you deserve because... You're worthy above all other names. You're worthy above all other gods and all other people. So, God, I pray that you will accept the glory, the worship that we give to you today. And, dear Lord God, kick any devil outside of this church so that, Heavenly Father, your Holy Spirit can have free access and full control over everyone in this church today. Because you deserve it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Please take out your white hymnal. Please take out your white hymnal. And we will sing in our white hymn books. <clears throat> we will sing the last page. If you can turn to the last page, please. Turn to the last page in your white hymnal. Some of you are going through that fire, like you see at that picture. I don't know what kind of fire you're going through, but you know what's beyond that fire? It's heaven's jubilee. Here we go. Some glad morning we shall see Jesus in the air, coming after you and me, joy is ours to share. What rejoicing there will be when the saints shall rise, headed for that jubilee yonder in the skies. Oh, what singing. Oh, what shouting on that happy morning when we all shall rise. Oh, what a glory. Hallelujah. When we meet our blessed Savior in the skies. Seems that now I almost see all the sainted dead. Rising for that jubilee that is just ahead. 
in the twinkling of an eye, change with them to be all the living saints to fly to that jubilee. Oh, what singing, oh, what shouting on that happy morning when we all shall rise. Oh, what glory, hallelujah, when we meet our blessed Savior in the skies. When with all that heavenly host we begin to sing, singing in the Holy Ghost, how the heavens will ring. Millions there will join the song, with them we shall be, praising Christ through ages long, heaven's jubilee. Oh, what singing, oh, what shouting, on that happy morning when we all shall rise. Oh, what glory, hallelujah, when we meet our blessed Savior in the sky. Bam! Amen. You know what? This is very unique. We are actually earlier than expected. We can sing one more song. So this is this yes. is new. We'll Amen. sing one more song, shall we? Good. All right Start. then. So you'll take out your white hymnal, and we will sing. I can't. Uh, uh, let's see. Where's that song at? One. Uh, I can't be at home in this world anymore. Forty-seven. 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 Uh, Pearly White City. A little too long. Yeah. So we'll sing a different song about heaven. All right. We'll sing page 47, and we will sing just verse 1 and verse 4. Verses 1 and verse 4. This world is not my home. Can I get an amen, amen. on that one? Amen. Oh, yes. man. Let it be today, Lord. Amen. Here we go. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't be at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be left home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land will live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their song of sweetest praise drift back from heaven's shore, and I can't be left home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be left home in this world anymore. Amen, Lord. Amen. I hope you felt our hearts, Lord. So that would probably put a little bit more pressure on you, God, hopefully. To sound that rapture right now. All right, so if Brother Sean can come forward and then... Give the announcements to us. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, church. Good to see everyone in church today. Uh, it was great to be out there door knocking, visitation today. Uh, Brother Stan and Brother Jack were out there backing each other up going door to door on their own and we had right. some other uh, faithful members that continue to uh, come to door knocking and try to grow and learn more so that they can get to a place where they can be if if the Lord put on their heart to go out by themselves they could go out and knock on some doors and lead some souls to salvation so that's a huge blessing um, we did have a profession of faith today I don't pastor did did y'all have any on your no, own not today. okay so we we had we had a uh, Someone who was raised Catholic um, professed their faith in nothing else but the Amen. shed blood of Jesus Christ today Amen. for their salvation. So uh, pray for Andy. Pray for Andy that um, the Lord will grow him and lead him and guide him into all truth as he's just beginning his Christian walk. As far as church announcements, for this next week, we will have Bible study at Pastor's House at 8 p.m. tomorrow. So 8 p.m. tomorrow, if any of you can make it, if you need pastor's address, just message him or me, and we'll get that to you. Next week, we're going to have street preaching next Sunday at the same spot as always, the Chevron gas station right on the corner over here. Um, that will be 1030 a.m. Very important announcement is for the summer camp, for the summer camp. 
uh, we need an answer by basically sometime today if you'll be able to come to, to summer camp uh, and all the details you can provide, like the days that you know you're going to be able to come, who's going to be joining you, um, if you have any questions about that, about the cost, about anything, uh, it'll be in our resources that we have in our, our WhatsApp group thread. Uh, we can also, if you don't have access to that, please ask pastor. So if you have any other questions at all about days, the cost, where to go, directions, anything like that, and you can't find it, uh, please go to pastor for that one. Our memory verse will be in Psalms chapter 12, if you could turn over there with me. Psalms chapter 12. It's going to be verses 7 and 8 this week. Verses 7 and 8, Psalms chapter 12. And this is going to round out the chapter. So uh, do the best that you can. If you haven't gotten all the way here, use uh, this upcoming week to nail down not just these last two verses, but um, the previous five. So that hopefully in a few weeks where we have review of the chapter, you can feel confident about reciting the whole chapter. Psalm chapter 12, verse 7, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. So verse 7, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So what is, what is the Bible talking about right there? That's the question. And if you've been going along with this week after week, you'll notice in the verse right before it, verse 6, what does it say? The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So God will keep and preserve his words. And he has kept and preserved his words. And the reason that this is so important is because a lot of Bible correctors and rejectors these days will point you to verse 7 and will say, oh no, when it says that he's going to keep them and he's going to preserve them from this generation forever, it's not about the words of God. It's talking about, if you look back earlier in the chapter, about the needy and the poor and the oppressed. He's going to keep those people. That's what they'll try to say. And how convenient, because when you don't believe that God did keep or preserve his words, of course, what are you going to say when you're shown that verse? It's clear as day. And it's the verse immediately after, verse 6, talking about the purity of the words of God how they're purified seven times, and how that's a promise you can hold God to. So if someone tries to ever you know, get you to doubt the words of God, you show them that verse and you say, the Bible says that he's going to keep his words and preserve them. So it, where can I get them? If, you, if you're telling me that there's errors in my King James Bible, where can I get them? And watch them squirm. It'll be very interesting. <laughs> verse 8, the wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. So that reminds me of a, uh, an old saying uh, you ever hear this one? Birds of a feather flock together. And that's the truth. That's the truth. The wicked really, truly, literally do walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. So if you want to know why you shouldn't be going to bars, if you shouldn't be going to uh, hanging around a, a certain group of people that you have no business being with, here's a perfect verse right there. Uh, you, if you're looking around and you're seeing the wicked walk on every side of you, you should probably be doing one of two things. You should be witnessing to all of them, trying to get them saved, or you should get away from them. You shouldn't just be fellowshipping with them. So verses 7 and 8, those are going to be our memory verses for this week. Do your best. Just faithfully do your best. And hopefully in a week or two here, you'll be able to recite the entire chapter, which will be awesome. And uh, we have a special from Brother Jack this week who's going to... Lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Y'all support him. I now have both feet it, and I'm so glad to be saved. Amen. 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 this uh, special, I, I have your will. We'll bless you guys today. Lift him up. Yeah. Yes. Amen. 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 Amen.
of you are immortal eternal beings right now now you might say oh I don't believe that no you are because this is just an outer shell and once this outer shell is gone you're still living and you'll be up in glory with the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll see the one who bought you at that auction block Amen. and you can properly thank him this time face to face all right brother Max if you can open up the service with a word of prayer please That's good, brother. There's just so much that could have been going the wrong way, and that all of us here, we are so blessed to be in this church, so blessed to be with this pastor. I'm just blessed that <laughs> the fact that you did that for us. Thank you, Lord. That you gave us Jesus. That is something that we should never deserve, but you gave us him. Yes. Thank you for that so much. Thank you for the brethren that are here. Thank you for the good music. Thank you for yes. the things that you've done for us. And so happy to be here. Amen, brother. It's been a long time. And I'm really happy to be here now. Amen, brother. Thank you, Jesus. Everything you've done for us. Thank you, God. Being real good to us. That's good, brother. Amen. Amen. That's good, brother. Amen. 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 Job chapter 1, please. Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1, please. I have about three to five sermons on suffering. And um, lately, I notice a lot of people in this church, they're going through personal sufferings in their lives. And um, the thing is, is that you'd be surprised how many other people in this room are going through sufferings too. So I can't list it all out. So then this preacher, he's got his own suffering, and then he hears like 10 or other people more. <laughs> it's such a blessing. But the thing is this, is that I can't make a new sermon on suffering because I did like three to five. And then so I was hesitant to preach on this one, but the Lord led upon my heart to preach this message. Perhaps some of you have heard this before, but you might need to hear it again. 
the Lord led upon my heart to preach this message. Uh, I remember that during our moments of suffering, uh, weeks ago, we can see it starting, but then it started to get better when enemies started attacking us. That When enemies started to attack us, you know, that just revved us up even more. That motivated us. That wasn't a suffering we weren't whining about, actually. But then now we're going through personal problems again. So I hope that this sermon will be a blessing and a help to you. Job chapter 1 and verse 12. Let's look at the man who went through one of the greatest sufferings. And the Lord said unto it, Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. <clears throat> and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another, <clears throat> and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> I got some in my throat. Sorry about that. <clears throat> and hath burned up the sheep and the servants, and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sin not nor charge God foolishly. Let's pray. God, my Father, I want to thank you so much for pulling me out through the fire. You've taught me for the past years in the ministry. It's been 10 years now. You've taught me, Lord, that through this suffering you give the grace to gain victory and that you will still provide and give fruit and give blessing and that you will never fail. Lord God, right now I'm going to preach a sermon that people in here will need to hear. It's something I've already experienced, so I'm getting, so I'm used to it. But there are some people here, Lord, that get discouraged, and this is new. So I pray that this sermon will be a blessing to them. You'll fill within the Holy Ghost unction, because Gene Kim is nothing in the preaching today. And it needs to be the Lord Jesus Christ. It needs to be Jehovah. It needs to be the I am that I am. You need to take full control today. May they see you talking to them, speaking to their hearts, Give them something spiritual in their lives that they can continually soldier on and glorify and serve Thee despite of persecution. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The title of my sermon is today is Suffer the Devil's Rage. Suffer the Devil's Rage. So we've learned in last Sunday that Satan, he is an adversary and he deliberately targets people. So you realize this is not a being you mess with. Now we're going to talk about the adversary what kind of pain, what kind of suffering and rage he can pour upon you. And I'm going to give you something that will hopefully help you. My first point is tested by God. Tested by God. You got to realize that the reason why these things happen is because God, he is testing your life to see if you will serve him faithfully, if you really love him that much. And all over and over again in our minds, we always wonder why. That is the first, the first two words that always come out. Why God? Why God? This happens quite often. Look at verses 6 through 8. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Now look at this. Why would God test us? Because this is how it starts. Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and is Jew with evil? 
So you see that? The reason why this suffering happened to you is because God knows that you love him, that you're a Christian who wants to give his or her life to Jesus Christ. God knows that. But that has to be proven. He can't just say that to all the world without proof because you got an adversary called Satan. And that adversary, he's the one that put all the doubts in people's mind and created people to become anti-Christianity, atheism, and majority of education to become non-Christians, right? So you have that kind of a smart being. So that smart being is questioning God, demanding proof. This is above all Harvard scholars you gotta understand. So God, he has to prove his point. He can't just say that those are just empty words. Oh, Gene Kim, he loves me, he'll serve me. But Satan says, oh God, those are just words. Those are just words. You know why he loves you? Because he's serving you faithfully. You blessed him and you provided him this and that. But if you do this particular instance on him, I know he will curse you to your face. Look at verse 12. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put forth not forth thine hand, so Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. See that? That's why the Lord let Satan go. Hey, go ahead and put that kind of particular suffering. Look, I don't know what kind of suffering you're going through. It might be some of you in work. It might be some of you younger people in school. It might be some of you who are going through in this church. It might be some of you who are going through financial problems or health problems. It might be family problems. I don't know what kind of problem you're going through in your life and I may not know about it, people in here might not know about it, but let me tell you something God does and the devil does too. So because of that, they see that weak point that they're going to checkmate you on. And Satan says, you know, if brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so in this church and Satan, you don't think he names you to God up in the throne? And he, will, he named you out many times and he says, you know, God, he's attending church now, but I do know this. If you push that a little more, if you do this particular yeah, suffering, right. then that person will not come to church and serve God anymore. That person will get mad and give up on you. That person will say, why God and why God? That person didn't actually love you after all. And then God, he has to prove it out. God has to prove it out so he can prove the devil wrong. Why did this happen? So you can prove the devil wrong. So you can prove the devil wrong that I still love Jesus Christ no matter what suffering you go through. You don't really love Jesus. Yes, I do. Prove it. And then when you prove it, then you look at the devil and say, see, I told you so. I love Jesus Christ. Amen. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. So you'll notice you don't have to turn to this verse. A lot of times I'll just quote verses without turning it. If you want to turn there, that's perfectly fine. I'll give you certain passages to turn to. Uh, but in these verses, I'll be mostly quoting. In this passage, you'll notice that God, he says that he gives suffering because it's a what? It's a manifest token. It's a proof of a token that you're counted worthy. You're counted worthy. Look at chapter 1 and verse 9 of Job. Look at verse 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Look at that. So notice, why does Satan attack you, right? You know, I hear quite often from other people who are going through a lot of suffering. Why me? Why me? Why did this happen to me? I hear that quite often. The answer is actually not that hard. It's actually simple. You know why? Because you're the one that's going to church. You're the one that's getting soul saved. You're the one that's trying to love Jesus Christ. You're the one that's trying to motivate others to come to church to get saved to serve God. You're the one that has an interest in Bible-believing truth. You're the one. That's why Satan will obviously pick on you so that you don't become a threat to him in infecting other people with Bible-believing truth with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you think it's obvious? He knows once you 
he picks that particular person, and I mean that specific, that particular person, then the rest of the people who are in the church or in the house or the friends and the family they're connected to, they will all fall apart like a domino effect. That's why he picked you. You think he's going to pick on somebody who's a backslider, someone who doesn't love Jesus Christ, someone who's worldly, someone who's sinning? He's not going to waste time on that. He's going to pick somebody that he knows that can get somebody else saved. Somebody that can give the person Bible-believing truth. And he knows once he destroys that person, everybody else can go to hell with him. Or if they're saved, be backslidden and apostate. Who is the only one that can ruin his system? Think about it. Think about it. Now, in this large... Silicon Valley, San Francisco Bay Area. Think about it. Who are the ones, the best ones, okay? The best ones he's going to target who's trying to get souls saved, who's trying to pass out tracts, who's trying to come to every church service, who's trying to tell others about God. Who's he going to pick on? Who's the best ones? Oh, he's going to pick somebody, right? In the city of San Francisco, who's probably a liberal, who's probably a homosexual. You think he's going to pick on that guy? he's a threat no he's going to pick someone who loves that king james bible who's trying to tell somebody about jesus christ what makes you think he's not going to pick you out Amen. oh why me why me simple you're the one who loves god you're the one who's trying to get somebody saved someone asked a christian before why do the righteous suffer the christian replied why not they're the only ones who can take it <laughs> that speaks volumes right there you know why? Because God knows that the righteous are the ones who truly love him. And love conquers everything, even through persecution and torture. Isn't that what the book of Romans chapter, the book of Romans chapter 8 says? Shall tribulation, nakedness, sore, separate us from the love of Jesus Christ? It's love that conquers all. That's why faith and hope, strong, strong, powerful elements, we look forward to the blessed hope the rapture that's what keeps us going faith invisible faith that's what makes us shielded from the attacks of satan but what trumps those two the bible says charity charity you know why because when you truly love god and love souls out there you don't care what kind of infliction you go through because you're completely selfless because you love other people more than you love yourself that's why you can take it A famous preacher once said, the closer you get to God, the closer you will get to the devil. You don't think that Satan, he's not upset when you start to get fruit, when God starts to bless your life, when you start growing spiritually. You don't think Satan's not going to get mad at you and attack you? First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1, it says, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Huh, look at that. So Satan was the one who provoked David to number Israel. But, uh, confusion right here, it's the Lord, not Satan, in 2 Samuel 24, verse 1. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. What in the world? What's going on right here? Why, it's very simple. Remember Job 1? Satan's the one who will do the attack. But then God's the one who gives the ultimate permission that you can do so. That's why both of them will do the decision together. That's why you got to realize this. When what you're going through in your life, there are two, the two most powerful beings in the whole universe are connected to your life right now. That's Satan and God. Do you realize how important the crossroads you're standing on right now? The two most powerful beings in the whole universe are paying attention to this life of yours. And the game is set. And the chess pieces are out. And they're versing each other. And then God's saying, that child, Gene, Kim, Gene loves me, Gene loves me. Satan says, no, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. And that game is still going on and on and on. And are you on the losing side right now? God's trying to say, I know he loves me. And he'll prove it. But then the devil says, I'll show you he really doesn't. 
Watch. He'll yield to that temptation and sin again. Watch it, all right? I'm going to open up that opportunity. Watch. That, per- that so-and-so is going to find some kind of flaw in the church and use that as an excuse not to come back. Sure. Watch that so-and-so right there. He's going to love that job and that school more and more, and then that person's going to give up on sure. you. Watch that person, God. You don't Watch that person. All I have to do is open up a great opportunity of the world, and that person will love the world more than he loves you. You died for the world, Jesus. But guess what? The world don't the world actually doesn't love you that much. And I'm gonna use that world that you died for to betray you. I'm gonna use that world that you died for to entice that soul, that Christian soul, and that Christian soul, he's gonna be a sucker. He's gonna eat up that money, he's gonna eat up that pleasure, that fame, the possessions. Watch, watch. I got I got billions already in my hand and what makes you think God that Gene Kim is not going to follow down on that trail with them watch and learn and then Satan's going to name so and so right there so and so right there so and so right there in this church watch and he'll name you name you name you name you name you and name you and name you watch 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 who's winning My second point is turmoil from God. Turmoil from God. Look at verse 13, please. Verse 13. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Okay, that's bad enough. But then verse 16, that's bad enough. The fire of God come down from heaven. That's not bad enough. Verse 17, another raiding party came in. That's not bad enough. Verse 18, 10 of his children died. 10, okay, if you lose one child, that breaks your heart, right? Imagine having 10 caskets in your funeral. You think you'll still serve Jesus Christ after that? Hmm. Now look at, but Satan's not done. Look at verse 7. You think that's the end? You think that's enough grief? You think the suffering that you're going through right now, Satan's going to end it right there? That's good enough? No, Satan will go all the way if he has to. Look at verse seven, chapter 2, verse 7. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him a potsherd to scrape himself withal. And he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What, shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. You know what happened? Now he's, uh, now he's inflicted with boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Now there's a lot of members that I've seen who've been uh, struck with this kind of infection, that kind of disease. But then there was one particular member that I know who was struck with some kind of infection that that person wanted to just die. Like literally die and the rapture to happen. And that was the unbearable itching that he felt from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. It felt like hell. And that brother told me, man, I just want to die. I just want to kill myself. I just want to go to heaven, etc. So Satan knows which infection to use that will drive a person mad, and he used that one on Job. He had to use a potsherd to scrape himself. You think he got enough grief already? Now he has to feel physically more grief. Like hell. Not only that, His beloved wife, who's supposed to hold him up, said what? Curse God and die. Can you imagine that? You're trying to hold your sanity together. You're trying to resist the suffering, trying to serve Jesus Christ, trying not to curse God and trying to love Jesus. And then you got a lover, uh, whether a wife or a husband, encouraging you to curse God and just quit. Stop coming to church. Stop passing out tracts. Stop telling me about Jesus Christ. Stop telling others about Jesus Christ. Stop giving money to the Lord's ministry. Stop reading that Bible. Stop doing it. Are you going to give up? Turmoil. Great turmoil. Job went through it. 
Let me tell you something. You're not the only special person, you see. There were many people, many people who went through so much similar things that you did and even worse conditions. Whenever we get blessings from God, you know what you should expect? Bad things from God as well. How can you expect that, you know, we're going to get so many souls saved, we're going to get many people to come to church, many people baptized, we're going to affect a lot of people out there, build a great ministry. How can you think and say that without expecting anything bad to happen? Do you really believe Satan's going to leave it alone and say, oh, let it prosper, let it flow, let it grow? No. He's definitely going to let bad things happen in your life. Think about it. Don't you think, how can you expect that God only gives you good things and he never gives you one bad thing at all? But then when he gives you a few bad things, you take that as enough to give up on him and get mad when he's given you far more good things in return? This verse is so important, is it not? Verse 10, verse 10. After the wife said, curse God and die, think about this. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What shall we receive good at the hand of God? Period? No. And shall we not receive evil? You don't expect that? You expect God to give you only blessing without testing? You must realize that when you have a crown, you will have a cross. When you have a rainbow, you will have rainstorms. When you have joy in the morning, you will have tears in the night. When you have a resurrection, you will have a crucifixion. When you have a upper room, you will have a Gethsemane. When you have a revelation, you will have an Isle of Patmos. When you have a millennium, you will have a tribulation. When you have life, you will have death. When you have rewards, you will have trials. When you have the high mountains, you will have the low valleys. When you have the healing, you will have the hurt. When you live in the spirit, you will die in the flesh. When you have the Savior blessing you, you will have Satan persecuting you. Right. You don't realize that for every good thing in your life, there has to be something bad as well that you will go through in life. Right. You can't expect to taste the fruit without sweating it out, without suffering something to bring forth fruit. Look at Job chapter 2 and verse 2. Job chapter 2 and verse 2. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? Now before I continue reading, i got to set the stage so you can really understand what you're reading. Do you remember chapter 1? What happened at chapter 1? Did you remember that? Chapter 1 and all the way back at verse 7. Whence comest thou, Satan? And Satan said, from going to and fro in the earth. And then, what did God ask him at verse 8? Haven't you concerned my servant Joe that he really loves me? And Satan says, oh no, he doesn't. Just let all these bad things happen and uh, he'll give up on you and he'll curse on you. And then God says, okay, go ahead. So Satan did it. He rained all hell on Job. And when Satan went to visit the Lord again, you know what God asked him again? He repeated from verse chapter 1, verse 7. He repeated at verse chapter 2, verse 2. Uh, Whence comest thou? And Satan answered the same way, uh, walking to and fro in the earth, walking up and down in it. And God, woo, verse 3, he didn't say, yeah, uh, I saw Job. He was cursing. And you know what? You were right. He was going to give up. And Gave up on me and he's living like the world. Is that what he said at verse 3? What did he say at verse 3? Hast thou considered my servant Job that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then he adds like a side note, like to rub dirt on Satan's face, like P.S. 
and still he holdeth fast his integrity. Although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. That's right. God did it for, well, without a cause. For no good reason, this bad thing happened. But God says, you made me do something so unfair to brother so-and-so, to sister so-and-so. In San Jose, Bible Baptist Church, you made me do it without a good cause, for no good reason at all. And I did it the way that you wanted me to do it. Look at him or her. He's still coming to church. He's still singing that hymn. Yeah, he's still yeah. here today as Sunday. He's praying on his knees. He keeps saying, praise the Lord, hallelujah, despite the suffering he or she is going through. He's still winning souls. He's still passing out trap. He is holding fast his integrity. Oh, thou, yeah. thou movest, movest me against him without a good cause. You can't quit. You know why? You're the best one God's going to use as his chess piece to checkmate on him. The Lord knows. The Lord knows. Some of you said, well, I give up. I'm on the verge of quitting. You know what? I quit. I give up on Jesus Christ. Can I say this? No, you don't. You did not quit on God. You said, yes, I did, preacher. No, you didn't. Yes, I did, preacher. No, you didn't. Why are you here at church today? Huh? Why did you bow your head in prayer? Huh? Why did you nod your head and say amen? Huh? Why are you listening to the preaching? Huh? Why did you bother coming to church at all? You did not quit out on God. God is still using you as a chess piece. The game is still on play. The game is not over. Satan, he's still versing against the Lord of glory. And God is still using this chess piece to turn the death, turn the table on the devil. And God is saying, you still see that? He's not done yet. It's not checkmate yet. That's chess piece is still holding fast his or her integrity. You might have a queen, a bishop, and a rook surrounding that chess piece but watch out this chess piece is still in play Amen. it's over God you see that he, he said why God he complained you saw that he got bitter Ooh, he complained against you he cussed that one time you saw that God and God said he's still not done she's still not done game still on play it's not over yet you know why because Lord willing that person who is being pounded and almost done will get on the altar today get right with God and repent and say Lord give me strength and give me grace to continue through the fire oh this illustration melted my heart in Travancore there was a little slave girl and this little slave girl a little girl and she's a slave she's called the child apostle now, this was long before Fox's Book of Martyrs, actually, all right, uh, during the Inquisition. How did she earn the title of the child apostle? You know how? Because she persistently witnessed to other people about Jesus Christ, despite of being a slave, despite of being abused and hurt by the masters. The Bishop of Madras he observed her face, her neck, and arms disfigured and scarred by stripes and blows. And that bishop was filled with tears in his eyes. And then, oh my, this is something. Oh, I got a blessing out of this. This bishop looked at this child with tears in his eyes. I mean, that would melt my heart and your heart if you saw that, right? And he asked the child, my child. How could you bear this? She looked up at him with surprise and said, Don't you like to suffer for Jesus Christ, sir? And here we are crying worse than little girls when this little slave girl counted it worthy to suffer for Jesus Christ and took it as something natural, Amen. took it as something, a joy to count it a great privilege to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. You're afraid to talk to somebody how to get saved? Then you'll remember one day at the judgment seat of Christ, this little slave girl, and not just her, there are many more little children who will come up and say, I witnessed to so-and-so, despite of being a slave, despite of being tortured, despite of being in prison, despite of being executed for it, how many have you got? You know what I start to do with, oh, you're suffering. I don't take it lightly. It's hard. I can't imagine it. But you don't know what kind of suffering I'm going through too. 
And you know what I say to myself? Oh, it's genuine. It's, it's really hard, God. It's really hard. And God says, as hard as that little slave girl? And I go, nope. <laughs> okay, God. Okay, I'm done. I'm done. All right. Let's go out soul winning. That's right. All right. P put on the face where I have the joy of the Lord. I'm going to church today, and I'm going to preach. And if someone asks me, how are things going, Pastor? I'm just going to say, oh, the Lord's been good to me today. The devil knows you are going to ruin his system and save some souls from hell. Some of you have a unique opportunity that other people in this church don't have to reach some souls out there. Some of you out there who are watching online, you got an opportunity to reach someone out there that I can't even reach because I'm here. And the devil knows that you're the one. So that's why he will persecute and abuse that little slave girl because he knew that she was the one. She was the one. That was the threat that would give the gospel. So he would make her life a living hell. But that little slave girl never gave up on Jesus Christ. I could preach a whole sermon just on that illustration, amen. Let's go to point number three. Talk to God. Talk to God. This last point is the... The number one blessing that you'll get out of this message because it opened my eyes this sermon that i preach i just want to let you know this when i prepared this sermon this was about uh, eight years ago an eight-year-old sermon i preached this when one of the members in our church lost her daughter who was pregnant with a baby and she was machine gunned by gangsters and i was like i don't know if she's coming to church sunday I was like, well, I'm going to prepare this sermon whether she comes or not. And she came. This is a sermon that I preached to her. I'm still in touch with them. One of their daughters is in our prayer list. She's been on the altar the longest time. Talk to God. Don't you have a lot to vent out to God? I don't know about you, but you got, your flesh is so weak. Don't act all pious and spiritual. Your flesh is so weak. You got, so, you got a hundred million reasons. Why God? Why God? Why God? And when he gives an answer, you're too smart. You, you, you're too smart that you can come in, up with an argument and an answer. Yeah. Well, you could have done this. You could have done that. All right. Guess what? You'll get your chance. Like Job. You know how long Job complained? All right. You notice that he began complaining about his trials and persecution he went through in life at chapter 3, right? After this opened Job his mouth and what? Cursed his day. He couldn't take it anymore. He was patient long enough. God bless his heart for holding out that long. But there's only so much more a man can take. And when he opened his mouth, guess what? Chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14. Oh, he had a lot to say, didn't he? You know, and these people were trying to answer in between, but Job had an answer against that. And so he yapped chapter 17, 18, go all the way to chapter 31, chapter 31. You think you got plenty to say? <laughs> this man had plenty to say too. Look at chapter 31 and verse 40. You can tell he was really mad. Let thistles grow instead of wheat and cockle instead of barley. Wow. The words of Job are what? Ended. He's done. 31 chapters long. You can have the best arguments in the world and you can have these theologians, what these friends who act like they're theologian scholars trying to explain and say, well, it's actually his fault, not God's fault, blah, 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 blah. And then you can have an answer and an argument to all of that 31 chapters long. You got a good reason. Don't, no, you don't have to tell me. I don't want to hear you 31 chapters long. I believe you. You got a good reason. You got a good argument. And guess what? I can't answer to that. I cannot satisfy your concern. I cannot help you understand God. I can't. No matter how smart I am, no matter how much of the Bible I know, no matter how many arguments I can think of, I've been through a lot of these cases and I have the answers to them. But after talking to so many people, I realize I cannot do it. I cannot. You know why? Because man in his flesh has every good reason in his, every, that feeling in his body 
that he's got a right. He's got a right to say, why God? And this is unfair. 31 chapters long, he complains against God. But look at chapter 38 now, verse 1. What did God do? Did God answer Job's questions and arguments? Did he say, oh, the reason why I did this is because of that, or, you know, I had a good purpose to do that and blah. No, he didn't do that. You know what God did? This is what's so interesting. Look at verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, so how did God answer Job? With questions. Who is this that darkness counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. So God's like saying, no, I'm not going to answer you. You answer me. <laughs> now that's totally unfair, God. What? No, 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 answer me. Now look at this. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut up the sea with doors when it breaks? You notice what he's doing? How he answers is, why don't you think about my creation, huh? Can you answer me why I did this, why I did it that way with my creation? Until you can answer me that, then you will understand how I worked in my creation. I did the same thing with mankind. And you know, it's all about just his creation. And then look at chapter 40, verse 1. So he, all he talks about his creation, that's it, just his creation. And then, you know what Job did? Job was satisfied. He was done, surprisingly. Look at chapter 40, verse 1. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer it. <laughs> then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay mine hand upon my mouth. Once have I spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. So, chapter 40, verse 1 through 2, you know what God said to Job? He asked, after he described all his creation, God simply asked him, is there anything you want to say to me, Job? And you know what Job said at chapter 42, verse 5, 5 through 6? He said, uh... All he did at verses 4, four and 5. Behold, I am vile. What can I answer you, God? I am vile. I am vile. Wow. Really? Really? Wasn't God being the unfair person here? Wasn't he the vile and cruel God? And yet you declare yourself to be vile now? You're the one? Unfathomable, incomprehensible, right? My friend, that's the weakness of human nature and human mind. Start comprehending all the workings of God in his creation. And when you look at every detail, how fascinating and why he did it. And it's so incomprehensible why he would even do that. But then you later see why he did that with his creation. When you see every little detail and you look at the millions upon millions of all that he did throughout history with creation and people's lives, then you will realize, what was I saying all that time? I am so stupid. I am so dumb. I've heard this a billion times before, but I never saw it that way. God, I am so sorry. I'm the dumb one. I'm the vile one. I'm the unfair one. I wasn't thinking in your shoes when I was demanding you to be in my shoes. See that? I mean, think about it. Let's say I go to heaven, right? And I go up to heaven and I got all my complaints set up, all right? Gene Kim, he, yes, sir. He's been through the worst kind of suffering than anybody else in this room. Yes, sir, Gene Kim, he's been the one who's been holding out and went through incomprehensible suffering. Yes, sir, me, 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 I'm the special guy above everyone else. Oh, poor me, woe is me, woe, woe, boo-hoo, boo-hoo, boo-hoo. I got a lot of things to say to you, God. And yeah, let's compare people and I'll show you what I've been through. And I can imagine when I go up to heaven and I'm ready with my complaints and I see God face to face. Why did you let this happen to me, God? Why did you let that happen to me? But then what's going to happen is that after looking at God's creation, he's going to prove, prove through his creation, his ways are way ahead of me of what I thought and predicted. 
And when he shows me that, that's so way ahead, then instead of complaining in action, then I'm going to be like Job. I'm going to be in awe. Wow. What is man? Behold, I am vile. Think about it. Here is God, and then he says, well, you got a lot of things to say to me, don't you, child? Yes, sir, I do. And God says, oh, okay. Uh, let me just show you some parts here with my creation. Can I take you a little bit tour about my creation before you give your complaint? God, this is important. Oh, tr this will be more important, okay? Let me show you something here. I don't know what you're trying to show me, God. I got a lot of things to do. Oh, take your time, breathe, relax. We got all eternity. Okay, calm down, Gina, all right? You got a lot to complain. We got all eternity. Just calm down, all right? Just take a few moments and you see that right there? You see that little piece of blade of grass right there? You see that little piece of blade of grass and then it's going to grow. And then here I am, I was like, but God, you know, that plant, it, it needs, that plant, it needs carbon dioxide to keep going. And what are you going to do? That blade can't just stand alone forever. And God's like, wait a minute, I'm way ahead of you. I'm way ahead of you. Look at that. You see that? I created the sun. What's sun going to do, God? Uh, sunlight. Okay, big deal. What's that going to do? Wait a minute. I'm way ahead of you. Okay? Look at that. You see the sun is shining down? Okay. You see that? Oh, so God, you must be planning to use that sunlight to give carbon dioxide to the plant. And, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm way ahead of you. Okay? It's a little bit more than that. Okay? You see that piece of human right over there? What are you going to use a human being for, God? I mean, what can he do? Well, I'm going to create him. And, and you're like, oh, so you're going to use that human to take care of that blade of grass, you know, somehow. No, no, no. He doesn't know anything about grass, all right? Well, God, what are you thinking? What are you doing? Wait a minute. I'm way ahead. Calm down. This is the problem with you human beings. You, you always think that, you know, you know the answer and there's a problem. Look, calm down. I'm way ahead of you, okay? You see that human being formed and being born? And yeah, he doesn't know anything about botany or plants. And there goes that human walking along the earth. There you go. Well, God, what are you going to do? The humans, uh, what they need is they need oxygen. So the plant, now you got three problems right there, okay? You got multiple problems, God. You didn't give an answer yet. This plant, blade of grass, needs carbon dioxide. And this human needs oxygen. What are you going to do? And God's like, whoa, calm down. I'm way ahead of you, child. Will you please calm down? Now, look at that. You see that human walking? And you see that blade of grass uh, growing? What's going to happen? Oh, you see that hu human? He's breathing. He's breathing, and he's giving carbon dioxide to the plants. Well, what about the plant? And then what about the human? He needs oxygen. Calm down. You see that carbon dioxide? It goes inside that plant, and that plant gives out oxygen to the human. Oh, I never thought of it that way before. It, that's right, because I'm way ahead of you. I told you my ways are past finding out, so stop figuring it out. Uh, let me show you another part of my creation. That was just one. That was just one out of the millions. Let me show you another instance of my creation right here. You see that ocean right there? Oh, God, what are you going to do? The ocean can't last forever, and then, you know, it's going to evaporate and be gone. And then God's like, whoa, 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 hold on. Okay, I know what I'm doing, okay? You humans, you just learn your lesson, okay? You see that sun? Oh, yeah, evaporating all that ocean water. See, God, that's a problem. I told you so. I told you. See, I told you you were wrong. That ocean's going to, can't last forever. That sun is evaporating all that ocean. I told you so. I, God's like, will you calm down? Look at that. Okay, you see that? It's evaporating, right? That's right, God, it's gone. Okay, okay, it's gone, all right? So there you go. The ocean, it's evaporating. Now you see that? Now that ocean evaporated, and then now it's going through... Uh, condensation and then precipitation. It's going from cloud to cloud and then now you see that? That thing goes up to the clouds and then there you go. It's precipitating water from the clouds. There's evaporation and precipitation and the water's going down out of the cloud and it's giving these little drizzles. But God, I mean, th that, that cloud that's giving all that rain, it's going all the way like 100 miles away. How's that going to fill up the ocean? It's going on dry land, God. Wow, that's brilliant. And God's like, yeah, it's brilliant, okay? Wait a minute, okay? You humans, wow, what's the matter with you? Always thinking that you got a right to complain, that you found a problem. Okay, you see that? 100 miles away, yeah, and then it's landing down on top of that mountain. Whoa, on top of the mountain? We're talking about the bottom of the ocean, God. 
wait a minute, will you please calm down? Okay, I'm way ahead of you. You see that now, that water, it's going down on the edge of the mountain. Look at that, it's turning into a river, you see that? Okay, a little river, how's that gonna take care of an ocean? Well, it goes down to a river and then boom, it goes back into the ocean. And you see that? That cycle continues with evaporation, condensation, and precipitation. Oh, I never saw it that way before. That's right, okay? You human beings don't know that, all right? I'm always way ahead of you. Now, that's just a second, just a second part of my creation. Let me give you another part right here, okay? Let me give you another part right here that you never thought of before. Okay, you see that animal right there? Eating up that plant. Oh, God, what are we going to do with the plants, all right? The plants are going to be all gone. You let the animal eat the plants and God's like, oh, yep, yep, that's right. You're complaining again. The thousandth time. How many Christians around this world have I heard complaining, yakking off their mouth? Why God, why God, crying about it, crying about it. Look, I'm way ahead of you. Okay, you see that? The animal eats up all that plant. Oh, man, look at that. That animal, he's taking a dump. <laughs> God, what is that? That is so silly. That is so stupid. What in the world? And God's like, I know, mankind always laughs on my workings. They always do that, all right? I know, silly, laugh it off. Yeah, I know. Look at that. See that human? Taking up the feces, taking up the dung. Oh, God, that's disgusting. Why would you have a human doing that? Wait a minute, I'm way ahead of you. See, they're using that as fertilizer. And now they're planting more things. Oh, I never, yeah, I know. You never thought of it that way before. I was way ahead of you. And this pastor here, he's not a scientist either. So all the details that I say, I'm sure are not every specific right detail. Can't you imagine how much God will give the details in a far better convincing and persuasive manner? Especially since he's the author and creator of those things. Now God takes a person, right? You know what? There I am. There's, there I go. You see that? I'm going to go down to heaven, from heaven here on earth. Why, God? Why are you going to do that? Well, you know, uh, I'm going to think about saving all of mankind. God, why, why, why coming down to earth, living as a human? I mean, what are you going to plan to? How are you going to save all the mankind? Wait a minute. I'm way ahead of you. You see that? I'm born in a smelly manger. What? That's not how you're going to save mankind. You have to be born as a, from a castle. They got to know that you're God, that you're the king. That way they can look at you and they can get saved. And God's like, wait a minute, I'm way ahead of you. Okay, now you see that? I lived 33 and a half years as a human. Look at that, doing miracle after miracle. Oh, yeah, God, you see that? You raised a dead person to life, God. Wow, you healed the blind and the lame and the leper. Now they're going to get saved. Nah, that's not going to happen. But God, that's a brilliant plan. Oh, yeah, it's a brilliant plan, but not that brilliant, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do all that and they're going to betray me and they're going to crucify me. What? Lord, what in the world? How you got a chance to have them saved and yet why would you have your son, your only son, God, how, how, can, who in their, what father in his or her right mind, what father in his right mind would let his son go through a bloody torture, a bloody mess, and go, and then let the devil persecute him? Look at that. I mean, uh, beard plucked out, nail struck in his hands, the whip struck on his back, carrying a heavy cross. Lord, I, he suffered enough. Uh, I think you should end it right there. Oh, that whipping post. Oh, that's gory. That's bloody, Lord. A lot of gore. Lord, uh, I think he suffered enough. And God's like, no, no, no. Let him bleed a little more. God, why would you do that? That's right. Uh, I'm way ahead of you, okay? Now he's going to wear that crown of thorns. God, why in the world would you do that? That's right. I'm way ahead of you. Okay, now he's going to carry that cross. Why carry the cross? You're going to let him get crucified on it? Just let him carry the cross and then call it a day. No, uh, I'm going to have him nailed on that cross. Okay, God, then I know what you're going to do. Then when those people say, call down the angels, call down Elijah and rescue him from the cross, then you can prove to all the world that you're God. No, I'm going to let him die. That's right. What, Lord? Why would you let him die? I don't understand. This is incomprehensible. Why would you let your only begotten son die on a cross, hung naked, and wait a minute, I'm way ahead of you. Look at that. They're putting that body in a tomb. Look at that. They rolled that stone over and covered it. Look at that. He's been buried three days and three nights. Look at that. You see that stone rolled away? 
Look at that. You see that angel coming out of that tomb? Look at that. You saw the Old Testament saints coming out and setting the captives free? Look at that. Do you see my son walking out of that tomb? Look at that. He went through those bandages, man, proving that he's God. Look at that. You see that? He's got 500 eyewitnesses. Look at that. You see that? He ascended up to glory. Look at that. He's the intercessor and the high priest up in glory. Look at that. He shed his blood to save all of mankind. Look at that. At Acts 2, the first church started. Look at that. You see that soul at Asia and Africa and America, South America, North America, and throughout continents and countries, praising songs and singing songs to my son and people on the altar getting saved and my son witnessing to a lost soul. Paul opening up the King James Bible and saying, would you like to receive Jesus Christ for your Amen. salvation? And that soul crying in tears and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Look at that. I'm going to tell you something. God is way ahead of you. I don't care what you cry. I don't care what you complain. And you know what? I can't say anything to you after that. My heart will break for you. But I'm going to tell you one thing. No matter what you say, it will never convince me that God does not have an answer that's way ahead of you. And he is many steps ahead of you. So all you can do is just put your hand on your mouth. Be like Job. Be like Job after he shows you all his creation. You go ahead and try to challenge God up in heaven. And He'll show you just one, two, and after his third creation, you'll shut your mouth and then you'll bow on your knees and say, Behold, I am vile. I have nothing to answer you. I've got nothing to say. Amen. You're worthy, God. Amen. Yep. I can imagine when I go up to heaven and when I'm ready to pour out my heart to God and complain to him, you know what's going to happen as soon as I go up in heaven? Rather than anger, it's going to be in awe because I see his creation. When I see his creation, I'm just too bedazzled. I'm just too amazed. And I've got nothing to say. Originally, my heart was filled with anger, grief, and bitterness and throwing in the towel. And no one is going to convince me to give up on God. But once I see his splendor of creation, it's a long walk through that streets of gold. And after seeing creation there, creation there, creation there, I finally reached that throne. And my anger subsided more and more and more and more. And then finally when I reached that throne, you know what God's going to do? He's just going to smile at me. <laughs> and he's going to say, you got anything to say, child? My words. Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. And the Lord truly gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. And that's Amen. what I'm going to do. You got the opportunity here on this altar. Will you come down and give him the glory? Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open. If the Lord laid upon your heart, feel free to come here forward on the altar's floor and give him the glory that he deserves. You can also pray in your seat. You can pray in your seat or you can come here on the altar's floor. We give you this opportunity and time to just be in awe with the Lord, to repent. God doesn't need to repent. God doesn't need to say, I'm sorry. It's you, it's you. Oh, what am I, vile. I will lay my hand upon my mouth. How weak and frail mankind is, are we not? So fallible and so weak and so dumb and ignorant we are. And how awesome is our God? How brilliant is our Lord? So many millions of years ahead. If any of you are not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, today can be the opportunity for you to get saved. If you were to die today, are you 100% sure you can go to heaven? Think about that. Are you confident you can go to heaven after you die? You might say, Pastor, I really don't know if I can go to heaven. I need to get saved. You can get saved right now, and it's very easy. Just A, B, and C. That's it. A, you got to acknowledge your sin. 
you got to realize that sin is a serious crime to God. And God punishes sin with a burning hell. So you can't go to heaven because of your sin. So you got to acknowledge your sin. You got to say, well, pastor, I'm shot then. What can I do? Nothing. Going to church, getting baptized, being a good person can get me to heaven. Wrong. Being a good person will never get you to heaven. You know why? Because no matter how many good things you do, <laughs> you're still going to sin. So sin is still the problem. You need something to wash that sin away. That's why Jesus died, buried, and resurrected so his blood can wash away your sin. You see that? Only what he did on the cross gets rid of your sin, not what you do. So that's B. Just simply believe on that. It's that simple. Just believe on the shed blood of Jesus Christ to save you. You might say, okay, pastor, I believe. What should I do? Here's C. See? You just confess it. Basically, you say it to God. That's it. All you have to do is say to God, God, okay, I know that I'm a sinner. I'm sorry. I'm going to believe in the blood of Jesus to save me. And it's that simple. You're done. It's that simple. See? God will never turn away a repentant sinner. If you realize your sinful condition, the seriousness of your sin, all you have to do is simply repent and only rely. All you can do is just rely and cling on to that blood of Jesus to save you. You can't clean up your sins. You can't go to church, get baptized, do good things to go to heaven. As a repentant sinner, all you can do is just believe and rest on the cross of Jesus. You might say, I can do that right now, Pastor. Great. Then here's a chance you can say it to God right now. You might say, well, Pastor, I don't know how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, I can help you say it to God. And don't worry, we're not going to point you out. No one's going to embarrass you. You don't have to say it out loud. You can just say it silently inside yourself, okay? You can say it, you can say it silently to yourself. You don't have to say it out loud and embarrass yourself. We're going to give you full freedom and privacy to do this. We want you to get saved. That's what we want you to do. You want to say it to the Lord? All right. I'll give you the words on how to say it. You can just simply repeat after me. Dear God, I am sorry for being a sinner. I believe Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so his blood can wash away my sin. So I'm only trusting in the blood of Jesus to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Amen. If you would bow your head and close your eyes one last time and we're done. Just 60 seconds and we're done, I promise. All right. Now, no one's going to point you out. If any of you have said, Pastor, I just repeated those words after you. I only believe in the blood of Jesus to save me. I've just repeated those words after you. Could you just slip up your hand real briefly? We're not going to point you out. I'm not going to point you out. No one knows who you are. Every head is bowed and every eye is shut. No one knows who you are. Could you just quickly, just briefly slip up your hand real quick? Okay, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's close with a word of prayer. God, my Father, thank you so much for salvation through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And dismiss us now with your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. 
So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure. You could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried, and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.